Well, good morning, and welcome to today's reflection from Christ Church. On Sunday, Graham spoke from Matthew 13, verses 53 to 58, under the title Introducing Jesus, looking at how people responded to him and challenging us to, as to our response. It's, it's a great start point to our series in Matthew. This morning, I just wanted to focus on verses 55 and 56, when the men of Nazareth started discussing Jesus after he taught them in the synagogue. As Graham pointed out, there's no mention of Joseph at this point, so we have, we have to assume he was no longer around. But let's get to the verses. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Now they'd at least heard of and probably seen miracles performed by Jesus. They'd heard him teach and clearly had been impressed by the teaching because even in their negative attitudes, they say, where did he get all these things? They couldn't see past what they thought they knew. He's a carpenter's son. We know his siblings. How can he amount to anything? That was all that they could come up with. Because they knew his human roots, they assumed he couldn't be anything special. No matter that they'd seen and especially heard of him doing amazing things. They'd heard teaching of a clarity, depth and meaning that they'd never heard before. But we know where he comes from, he can't be special. Sheer prejudice. If only they'd asked Mary. But in those days, they were prejudiced about the testimony of any woman as well, not considering them credible witnesses to anything. They had a lot to learn on oh, so many levels. And those attitudes cost them dearly. Verse 58. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief hard-heartedness and rejection of Jesus prevent the Spirit's healing ministry. Their flagrant, willful rejection of God was a block. As one commentary I read puts it, the Holy Spirit does not force his miracles on a hostile, skeptical audience. So what has that got to do with us today, this morning? Well, I guess the first part is easy to look into our hearts and see if we prejudge people because we know their background or think we do, because we know what school or university they went to or didn't, to see if that prejudgment blindly and blithely disregards the evidence of our own eyes and ears, a sort of guilty of not being real until proven innocent, except that I can't be bothered to listen to any evidence that contradicts what I'm comfortable believing. I was reminded about what Robbie Keane said a couple of weeks ago when he told of his uh, bad background and his lack of experience or qualifications and how he rejoiced in that. Because, as he said, it made clear that everything that was achieved in Uganda was achieved by God, not man. How would we have viewed Robbie at the start of his ministry? If we'd been on a, a sort of selection panel, where would we have put our weight? On the evidence? or on our own preconceptions. We all need to remember that our worth, our value is not in what we own, not in our strength, but is in Christ and his love and grace and mercy. It is all too easy to fall into the trap of preconceptions, to think we know better because we know the family. Incidentally, that also works the other way. A super spiritual family doesn't guarantee that all children, all siblings will be worth listening to. No, we must learn to listen to God and learn. We must not have closed minds, minds that disregard anything that doesn't conform to what we think we know. We must not reject God. More especially, we must act in such a way, show such behaviors that we actively encourage others to trust God. 
the evidence before these people in Nazareth was overwhelming, yet they chose to ignore it. There was and is a real spiritual background before us. We need to help each other and the world around us put away the easy labels and see God's reality. The reality that each person is precious in God's sight, that God can and does use anyone, that they're special because they're trusting God and following him, not because of where they've come from or their family. The marker point is what they have let the Holy Spirit do in their lives. And that comment takes me back some 45 years to when we lived in Geneva. We'd moved there from the UK and what was regarded as a solid evangelical Anglican church in Litchfield in Staffordshire. And we had eventually gone to the Evangelical Baptist Church of Geneva, EBCG. This was a multinational community drawn from all sorts of backgrounds. It was full of great teaching and real agape fellowship love. But it was also a culture shock at first, when on probably the second Sunday we attended, we were greeted not with the standard, how are you? But the words, so what has God done in your life this week? Now I'm not suggesting that our welcome team, team use those words next Sunday but the passion behind them of both expecting and wanting God to be working in our lives every day is something that I think is great. And I go back to those people in Nazareth. If only they'd asked and listened to Mary, listened to her tell them what the angel Gabriel had said, Gabriel had said to tell them what the wise men and the shepherds had said and done. If only. I just pray for our friends, our families, our communities, that there will be no, if only, regrets. Let's pray. Father God, help us always to listen to you, to be guided by you through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we are able to make right judgments, not decisions based on our preconceptions. Open our minds and hearts, Lord, to listen to you, to respond to you, and grow ever deeper in our relationship with you. And help us, Lord, to introduce you to all we meet in your strength and for your glory. Amen. The song I've chosen is by Keith and Kristen Getty. It is, my worth is not in what I own. The words are a great reminder to us. Have a blessed day.